This tank chat is going to be about the very famous Soviet tank, the T-34. We're going to look at the T-34-76, this model, and also a look at a T-34-85. Now, this tank, it's quite hard to explain and talk about because it is surrounded by such a history and such a number of myths. And it's become an iconic vehicle uh, for Soviet Russia and that great patriotic war. So we're going to try and take some of those issues apart as we look at it. This particular T-34-76 is a very early one and we're very fortunate to have it here. It was actually captured um, by the Finnish forces in the continuation war. There's the winter war of 39-40, later on, later 41, the war begins again uh, against the Soviet Union. And the Finns capture a number of vehicles, including this very early T-34, they put it into service themselves. And this particular vehicle, it's got modifications on it um, that the Finns did, and it was actually still in service as a training vehicle into the 1950s uh, with the Finnish military. Um, the swastika on the side, that by the way is a Finnish symbol that's been used by their military. It's nothing to do with Nazism. Um, people often wonder why that's on there. The fact they happen to be fighting on the German side against Soviet Russia, um, that's one of those coincidences. Um, but again, so this particular vehicle is on loan to the Tank Museum and we're very grateful for the Finns for lending it to us. Now we need to start back with what's the Red Army up to in terms of its use of tanks. The Red Army is first formed in 1918 um, and it takes a number of Tsarist officers into its formation. It looks at what the best way for the Red Army to fight a future war is going to be and it studies quite a number of different developments, even studies like the um, Commonwealth use of combined arms at the Battle of Amiens. It looks at a whole range of different issues and there is a massive debate within the Soviet uh, military hierarchy about how should we fight a war in the future. Now, one of the people, Mikhail uh, Tukhachevsky, is looking at the idea of using armoured forces for a type of warfare that um, at one point gets called the warfare of annihilation. Let's have the Red Army as a massive, very sophisticated, technologically advanced force which will deliver a crushing blow onto any enemy. There's another school of thought that argues along the lines of saying, no, let's use Russia's great country, its depth, um, let's go along the way of a, of a sort of sense of attrition rather than annihilation. And that traditionally, uh, that attritional warfare is how Russia's uh, fought wars in the past. Now these debates go on. 1929, uh, Stalin comes to power. He decides he's going to back um, Mikhail Tukhachevsky's ideas. And he's going to, Tukhachevsky's actually even arguing to say, let's industrialize the whole of Soviet society to build not things like freezers or fridges for the homes. Let's do it to build tanks, airplanes, and make us this great military power. Now, Stalin knows he's about to start implementing the five-year plans. He's going to back Tukhachevsky um, because he wants, he likes that as an idea, and he also needs the Red Army on his side as he's going to implement all these future plans. Now, in 1930 then, out go Red Army uh, agents to buy from Britain the Vickers export tank, and from America, they buy a couple of examples and a license for the Walter Christie tank that hasn't gone into production in America, but has that famous Christie suspension on a very fast vehicle. And in Russia, these vehicles, um, the Vickers export tank is developed into the T-26 tank, and it is started to be built in huge numbers in Russia. And with the Christie tank, it becomes the BT series of tanks. Again, these are going to be fast, quick moving vehicles that are going to be the equivalent of cavalry tanks. T-26, much more the infantry tanks. Now those vehicles take time to build in the factories and Russia also has a problem of industrialization. That's why these five-year plans, how do we actually push through an industrialization process? So again from America, um, the Soviets bring in 
uh, Alfred Kahn, who's an American designer of factories, and he ends up building huge numbers of factories um, to help the Russians build this new tank fleet. Uh, the famous Stalingrad uh, tractor factory is actually one of Alfred Kahn's uh, creations. Now, that process of building these vehicles, some of them are not built to a great standard. The Russians have a lot of trouble with their metallurgy, so some of the early tracks are fairly weak. Uh, and by 1937, they're already looking at what might be the replacement vehicle, certainly for the BT series of vehicles. Now, this is when the designer of the T-34, uh, Mikhail Koshkin, comes into the picture. He's working at the Kharkov locomotive or common turn locomotive factory it's called um, basically they're building tanks there and he's set the task of can he build a replacement for the bt tank and his first model that he comes out with is something called the a20 it's got sloped armor it's got a 45 millimeter gun uh, it's going to have potentially a diesel engine in the back and uh, it's also one of these ones they call it eight by six it's actually got six of the road wheels are powered by the engine as were the BT series and that dates back to the fact that early track technology was a bit unreliable if you could run your vehicle on wheels on the roads till you need the tracks that would be better now the problem with that it means extra technology lots of extra com uh, complexity to the design and build of the vehicle and that idea is fairly rapidly dropped in this A20 prototype 20 millimeters of frontal armor, nicely sloped. Um, but again, we're looking at 1937 here. 1938 with Lake Kazan, 1939 with Kalkin Goal. Lots of lessons are learned from these battles. And what comes back is the use of the T-26 and the BT tanks, such as issues such as the welds not being very good. Uh, the enemy anti-tank guns, even though they weren't that powerful, could penetrate the armor. So Koshkin has a rethink and he goes back to Stalin and the Red Army and said, look, shouldn't we build something more powerful, thicker armor protection, all round a better tank and perhaps even a universal tank? In other words, this could be a tank that takes over from the BT series and also uh, the T26 series of tanks. Let's combine them into one new type of model. Now he goes away, the first prototype of his new model, um, it goes through another development, uh, it's got thicker armour on it, T40, it's got a bit of a thicker armour on there in the first place. They start looking at a bigger gun, they improve on that newer model, and ultimately that becomes really the prototype of what becomes the T34. Now Koshkin calls it the T-34 because he dates back to 1934 is the time he's first thinking of some of the ideas and the theories that go into that T-34 tank. So what's he come up with? He comes up with a tank that has a 76.2 millimetre gun on it, about a three inch gun, and that's big for tanks at the time. He comes up with, he's already got the idea of the sloped armour, sloped armour's been around for a while, um, but the level of protection now is quite considerably more that he puts on this first model T-34. And another issue, just like the American Sherman, during the production run of T-34, the levels of armour protection go up. They almost double during its production run. Um, he gets this uh, V12 diesel engine, V2K engine, that goes in the back of this vehicle. Diesel engine, aluminium block, uh, the designer of that engine ends up in 1938, a guy called Kelpin, ends up being shot in one of Russia's or Stalin's purges. Um, it's got a transmission system um, that is at the beginning fairly rough and ready, but again, through the process of manufacture, starts improving. And this first prototype is sent out on the road for a 2,000 kilometer road trip. They go from Kharkov, they visit Moscow, they show the vehicle off um, to the Kremlin, to Stalin, and it's uh, taken around the houses. And again, obviously, in that sort of early uh, driving, certain transmission teething troubles come out, further changes are being made. Now, there's an onus now on the development of this tank because already, even though there's been doubters about do we want to go this big, heavy, it's about a 28-ton vehicle, 
Um, do we want that amount of firepower? You've got the people building the KV-1, KV-2 tanks. They're looking as, as if to say, hang on a second, this is a rival for us. We don't like the idea. There's people in the Red Army are saying, no, it would be much more sensible for the Soviet economy to perfect and keep on building the BT and the T-26 series of vehicles. But what's happening is the Winter War 39 to 40 shows again, as did Kalkin Gol um, and Lake Kazan battles at the end of the 30s, the weakness of those designs. And of course, in May of 1940, with the German invasion of France, Blitzkrieg, we see then, or the Russians see, the use of new armor and the way that the Germans are using vehicles like the Panzer III and the Panzer IV. So now all of a sudden that T-34, there's an emphasis behind it and by September of 1940, the very first production vehicles are now starting to come out. Um, Koshkin, the designer, he dies of pneumonia in uh, September when those first vehicles are, are being issued and uh, his role as a developer um, of the T-34 is then taken over by the chap who's been building uh, the transmission. So he ends up looking after the development of the T-34 through into the T-3485. Now that T-34 tank, the early models, again, like so many tanks, they have a number of failures. I've already mentioned metallurgy, that consistently becomes a problem for the Russians. Transmissions, um, there's photographs of some of the early T-34s driving around with a spare transmission literally bolted to the rear of the vehicle um, because there were so many failures, so you took a spare one with you. Um, they have a number of problems there with that vehicle. Um, there's only about 900 of them are in service by the summer of 1941, when of course, here comes Operation Barbarossa and the Germans invade the Soviet Union. There's about 500 KV-1 tanks ready at about that time. The vast majority of this enormous Soviet tank fleet at the time is still BT uh, tanks or um, the T-26 series of tanks in, in huge tens of thousands of numbers. Now the Red Army that meets that German invasion in the summer of 1941 has gone through in the late 1930s a series of purges from Stalin. He's got rid of at least 35,000 officers. It's getting new equipment that's starting to come into service. Um, it has expanded massively and rapidly with this threat of a German war on the horizon. Originally it was being built up much more along the lines the traditional enemy was going to be there, Poland. Um, then all of a sudden, Stalin has got his molotov ribbentrop pact. He's done a pact with Hitler. Some say that's to bide him more time. Some say it was just naivety. Um, he's got an extra year or so. But that Russian army, it's described as a stumbling colossus. It is not in a very fit state to fight the war that is coming its way, even though it's got some of these new vehicles coming into service. Now this tank, the T-3476, um, again, we hear great stories about it in terms of when the Germans first encounter it, they are absolutely amazed at the thickness of its armor, the power of its gun. But tactically, it's used very poorly by the Red Army. What tends to happen, and some of this is due to the design and the crew ergonomics of it, um, but these guys who are driving these vehicles have had very little experience on the vehicle Command, control and leadership is frankly abysmal at the time in the Red Army. And so even though there's some outstanding examples of T-34s um, doing heroic actions, holding up um, enormous German forces, statistically, really most of them, about half of them are breaking down before they even get into action. Um, and that problem is, as I mentioned, some of it as well is to do with the design. So for example, when we look at this vehicle, the early model T-34s with that turret, um, that's a two-man turret. Now, I'm not that big a bloke, but I couldn't even fit my shoulders into that turret across the rear there. So how two guys are supposed to be in there, the commander and also the gunner is supposed to fit in that very tight space. You know, that is a cramped area there. Um, the other issue, the commander doesn't have a cupola. So his actual vision from inside that vehicle, he's got one periscope. And again, the Germans report on the fact that quite often they could get three aimed accurate rounds off for every one that the Soviets are firing. 
and only platoon commander's vehicles have a radio. So these vehicles in a platoon are signalling to each other, either with flags, and as you can imagine under fire, the last thing you want to be doing is opening up your hatch and starting to do flag signals. So again, some of these early accounts, the Germans are reporting on these tanks almost following each other around, not being very tactically aware, not using the very thick armour that they've got comparatively at the time and their impressive firepower to great effect. Now the early model uh, L11 gun, the 76.2mm gun, um, a, a design bureau, the Graby Design Bureau at, uh, um, in, in Russia is, ends up coming up with a better design. They call it the F-34 gun. Um, they are not given official permission to start producing this gun, but they go ahead anyway. And it's only because of the good reports on this newer gun, with its better penetration that comes back from the front line, that that starts being added to the 1941 model of the T-34. So again, it's part of this story that as the T-34 goes through its development, um, it goes through a number of changes. Now that gun firing an armour-piercing composite rigid round, in other words, a slug of something like tungsten within a wider 76.2 millimetre sheath, that round could go through 90 millimetres of armour plate at about 500 metres. And you have to think in the summer of 41, um, if you're looking at the Panzer III and the Panzer IV, most of those tanks, maximum, you've got about 60 millimetres of armour. So that's a very effective tank killing gun early in the campaign. Um, we've mentioned about reliability, um, that diesel engine in the rear, um, why tracks? Tracks, of course, the Russians know about Russian winters, and of course there's not that many metalled roads, surface roads, in Russia. So the idea of the wide track to spread the weight, and that engine gives this vehicle a power that can speed it up to about 33 miles an hour. So that's a good turn of speed for about what turns out to be a 28 short ton tank. Um, so it's still a fairly weighty tank there. Now the German invasion in the summer of 1941 causes something that again almost adds this magic to the T-34 story. They've got to move some of the factories that are now making the T-34 out the way of the advancing German military and they take them back behind the Ural Mountains. And that means not only taking the machinery, taking bits of equipment, that means taking the engineers, the people that are manufacturing, men and women, are actually drawn back to re-establish their factories and keep this production going. And in that process, one of the things the Russians find is they say, look, we're not gonna do anything to that vehicle unless, it, even though they know it's got weaknesses, unless it speeds production or it lessens cost, because we need those vehicles now. Uh, the Russians in 1941, can you believe this is a figure? They lose 20,000 tanks in that German advance. They have a lot of tanks that they need to build, and uh, they need to build quickly. So with that movement of the factories starts this process of things on the T-34 that were considered superfluous start getting removed and you get to the point that there's uh, a certain point where some factories are, are sending out these T-34 tanks without even a driver's seat in. If you want a seat, you fold up your great coat and sit on it. Um, so some of those vehicles are, uh, are different from different factories because of what's available to them at that time, but they're also, the Russians are realizing there's a lot of things that can go into a tank that if it's just, is it really necessarily number one or can we simplify it? And the great story of the T-34 is during its production, it ends up doubling the thickness of its armor, it doubles its penetration ability of its firepower, and it halves the cost of making one of these tanks. So they start with for about 290,000 rubles, they get it down to about 160,000 rubles. Um, and they get to the point that they're producing 1,200 of these T-34s in about 1942 a month. I mean, that's a staggering figure to be able to coming out with. And that's that key in the background. What we've got to remember with the T-34 is the numbers that can be produced. It has excellent elements to it as a tank. It has abysmal 
crew ergonomics. Um, the poor driver in here is visibility, um, the amount of muscle power he needs to change gear. All these things are, are not good about that vehicle. But when you can produce them in so many numbers, that is bound to have an effect on the battlefield. Now its superiority in firepower and armor protection starts waning fairly qu quickly in 1942. The original German 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, not that effective on a T-34. There's this account of uh, one of the gun crews, they fire about 25 rounds. The only effective round um, from that 37 millimeter manages to jam the turret. Um, but then the Germans are starting to get five centimetre towed anti-tank guns and then 7.5 centimetres coming into service. And of course, from uh, 1942, the Panzer IV is then having that long-barreled, high-velocity 75 millimetre gun fitted. So all of a sudden, these T-34s are not as an impressive bit of kit on the battlefield. Uh, and again, in terms of losses, Many of these vehicles, we always think here, tank museum, tank on tank warfare, actually it's anti-tank guns are doing a huge amount of the damage. Now for the T-34, so success though it is, it is also the tank that gets knocked out the most in World War II. 44,000 T-34 losses in the combat. Now some of those tanks are taken back to the factories, rebuilt, reissued. And that's another one of the issues because as I've mentioned already, all the different factories are building to slightly different build standards, slightly different design parts. And of course, when we're adding up numbers, there's the other issue, which is these factories are also, they're doing new build, but also taking in damaged vehicles and they're added to the mix and then they go out again. So you'll see uh, it's almost hard to find two T-34 tanks with exactly the same design build um, because there's so many little alterations and changes and improvements. Simple things as well, like in that, trying to make it simpler, get rid of the rubber on the tires. Things like the F-34 gun starts off with over 800 component parts. They cut that down to 600 component parts. So again, that idea of simplifying the process. Now, by the summer of 1943, it is readily apparent to the Red Army um, that not only with the Panzer IV with the long barrel gun, but then certainly at the Battle of Kerr starting to meet the Panther, that the T-34 is suffering. So they start a program for a replacement vehicle and that's what we'll have a look at next. The realization that they're going to have to build a new tank leads the Russians to come up with a design that's called the T-43. Now the problem with the T-43, they've got some good ideas. Let's keep about 70% of its construction from parts that are already being built from the T-34. The problem though is that when it comes out, it ends up being less mobile than the T-34. And uh, even though it's got a new turret with a new 85 millimeter gun on it, uh, it's not considered a success. Uh, and therefore they go back to the drawing board and have another look at the T-34. Um, what that develops into is they realise actually we can enlarge the turret ring on the T-34 from originally it's 56 inches, they take it up to 63 inches and they take this new three-man turret that's been designed for the T-43, adapt it and put it on uh, an enlarged T-34 hull. And that becomes the T-34-85, the 85mm gun-equipped tank. Now that process leads to the tanks going into service in about February of 1944. And when we look at the T-34-85, we're actually looking at a very different beast. Yes, it's a T-34 evolved, but at the same time it's adding things for the crew that makes this a much better tank to be able to fight from. For example, the commander now in the top has his own cupola, um, so he can look out all around rather than that one original periscope he was given. Um, the turret now has a turret basket. The original T-34 had no basket at all, um, ammunition stored on the floor uh, under rubber mats. You open the box, took out the ammunition, passed it up. Um, now with this vehicle, yes, ammunition still stored on the floor, but it's now got a turret basket, which means the crew can turn together. Uh, within the vehicle as well, other changes that go on. Um, we've now got a three-man turret. 
So three men, the commander now doesn't just have to command and man the gun, he can just be his, what his real role is, looking out for targets, commanding the whole vehicle. That's important. Um, we get an increase in the ratio of radios. Not every tank gets one, but most of them now start getting radios. And that is fitted in the turret uh, in the T-3485. The original fit in the earlier T-34 turret was on the floor of the vehicle. So again, access issues uh, for communications. Now this enlarged turret, um, three-man crew, that loader is now being added there as well as the gunner. Um, so again, crew ergonomics better from the point of view of the workability of the vehicle. Uh, much of the hull remains the same apart from the addition of further thicker armour. So we're now up to about 90 millimetres of, of armour plate there. Because the gun's bigger, the amount of ammunition goes down. Uh, early T-34s, you get around 90 uh, rounds of the 76 millimeter ammunition in there. Now with this bigger gun, you're down to about 50, up to 55 rounds. And there's normally about nine ready rounds stored inside the turret, ready to be used. The rest of them, again, on those floor boxes um, down further below. Now these vehicles go into production. They are also starting to be used tactically if we go back to that earlier talk about when we were looking at how the Russians thought they were going to use their military, this early phase of the war has been that war almost of attrition. They're using their space, they're using, they're massing themselves. The second phase of the war, and this almost heralds it when it's coming in from uh, the beginning of 44 onwards, you're now looking at that other Soviet theory that they wanted to fight with, which is that war of annihilation, using their operational art, um, that kind of that, that deep battle theory that they've been looking at in the 1930s to great effect with operations like Bagvatron um, and the advance on Berlin. Stunningly successful use of heavy artillery, tanks, tank riders. So on these vehicles, you'll notice on the side of them, Metal bars are added so that again, you've almost ended up with motorized infantry that could be taken into action in the back of these vehicles um, and the use of air power, of course. Um, those things coming to back, back together mean that the effect that the Soviet Red Army has in 1944-45 is, is gone leaps and bounds forward from just trying to do their earlier war tactics of delaying and trying to hold up that massive German advance. And as I say, vehicles like this, are really key to that. Now the T-34, um, it's produced in massive numbers, as I mentioned earlier, about 80,000 we think all told, um, and it's continued in production after the war ends. Uh, by the end of the war, about 55% of the Soviet tank force is made up of variants of the T-34 vehicle. Uh, it stopped production, it actually goes back into production in both Poland and Czechoslovakia in the early 1950s. And of course, there's so many of these vehicles, uh, a bit like the American Sherman, which has got a lot of comparisons with, um, it ends up being either sold on, gifted to Soviet satellite countries, used all around the world. The list of countries where the T-34 has fought uh, is enormous. And uh, those battles it's involved in is another whole story, the use of the T-34 after World War II. Um, still in service with some armies right into the 21st century. Now the issue about the T-34 overall as well, one of the other things when we look at this tank is what we're looking at now is less about whatever I say about facts, figures, um, misinformation that's come out over many decades because again, um, from the Soviet area, some of this information was uh, bigged up in a way about its success. Other information didn't come out of the archives till much later on, and it's still appearing. So trying to form a view of this particular tank is very hard to come up with an accurate one. No doubt I've been saying a number of mistakes in what I've been talking to you about in this talk. But the issue really is what this tank symbolizes. This is the tank for the Russian that symbolizes their victory in World War II. It is not the tank that wins World War II for the Russians. It's actually the spirit and the stoicism of the Russian people that does that. But because, just like in Britain, the Spitfire becomes that iconic item, this is for the Russians one of those items that has now moved beyond just the facts and figures. It becomes a symbol and an icon of that victory. And you can see that recently because about 40 uh, T-34, 85 tanks have been gifted by the government of Laos. Um, they've transported them back on railway flats going all the way through Russia, 
people have been turning up at stations to almost pay homage to these vehicles as they go past. And those vehicles are going to be used again in parades, in celebration, commemorations into the future. That's what this item actually means to the Russian people. If you enjoyed that video, please support the Tank Museum by subscribing to their YouTube channel and also support them on Patreon.